Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, if we've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Mark, one of the pastors here. Uh, we're in the middle of this series that we have called uh, G4. And you see up on the wall over there for this series, uh, just a reminder of what this is about. But let me begin uh, today by letting you know about a real challenge that the Surgeon General identified. This sickness that impacts 47% of all of our population, double the number of adults it even was just a decade ago, and this malady contributes to mortality rates more than obesity, and as much as somebody who smokes 15 cigarettes a day. It contributes to high blood pressure, it contributes to cholesterol levels, it leads to depression and suicide. Do you know what this sickness is? Loneliness, okay? Loneliness is deadly. 40% uh, of U.S. adults report feeling alone, 47% feel left out, 43 feel their relationships are not meaningful, and they're isolated. And guess which generation actually feels the most lonely? You would think maybe it'd be some of our older folks, but actually it's our Gen Z folks, people who are born after 1995, who have the most technology, but feel the least connected. And so today, maybe you're in one of those percentages. Maybe you're here because you've said, you know what? I have felt alone, and maybe I'll go and check out church. We're really glad you're here. Uh, today, what we're going to discover is God wants to help anybody who's feeling lonely. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to take a look at what the scriptures have to say about loneliness. And it starts with this next G in our series, this idea of what it means to grow together. Um, we've talked over the last couple of weeks that first we're called to gather with God. We gather with God individually, daily, through prayer and Bible reading. We gather together in corporate worship. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about, well, God doesn't just call us to gather. He calls us into a group, smaller groups, to grow together, to learn together. So uh, here's what we're specifically going to do this morning. We're going to diagnose this problem of loneliness, which is actually more complicated than it might seem at first. And then we're going to talk about what God did to address it. And then we're going to talk about what our church is doing to help you um, to experience real community. Sound like a plan? Yes, Mark, sounds great. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're with me. All right. All right. So to one degree or another, we all struggle with loneliness. Yes. Okay. And every one of us uh, has this, this, this sense of there's something that's just not a full connect all the time. The question is why? And so that's why we'll start with diagnosing this, this issue. Um, and the best way I know to introduce this is to ask another question, which is what was the first crisis in the Bible? Now, you would say that, well, you know, there's that thing with Adam and Eve and, and the fall, but actually there was an earlier crisis than this. Adam is designed by God, and there he is, and God brings him along, and God says, I want you to name these animals. Just so happens that the, the duck comes along and has a compliment. The elephant comes along, there's a male and female. And God says, okay, we have a problem here. Genesis 2.18 says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, this was not a surprise to God. Okay, this was not like, oh, I guess I didn't see this coming. God knew this was coming, so why is it here in the scriptures? It's here to point out something really important to all of us. You and I were not created to be alone. We, you hear this scripture primarily from preachers, okay, in a, in a wedding ceremony, but this is not primarily about marriage. This is primarily about our innate need for community, that you and I were designed to have fellowship with God, but also with one another. 
It's not good to be alone. Okay, so think about this too. Adam had fellowship with God in ways we will never have on this side of eternity. He saw God face to face. He conversed with him like a friend. He even walked with him. And still God said, this isn't good. It's not good for humanity to be alone. Something more is needed because we are designed for community. Let me take this a step deeper. What does it mean to be designed for community? If you were to take a picture of God, what would God look like? Okay, somebody needs to give me the Sunday school answer. Jesus. Okay, so yes, if you said Jesus, God looks a lot like Jesus. He is the visible image of the invisible God. That's what scripture says. However, if you wanted to take a more comprehensive understanding of who God is, you have to start talking about Trinity. God is a unity in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, and a Trinity in one. So if it were possible to take a picture of God, you would see God as loving community. As the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father through the Holy Spirit. And as the Son loves the Father, he does the same through the Holy Spirit. And this is not just esoteric theology. This is not just, oh, this is interesting, let's go talk about this over a glass of wine. This is really important, not only for the way we understand God, but also for the way that we understand ourselves. Here, follow me on this. If we neglect this picture of God, it distorts how we understand ourselves. Genesis 1 verse 27 says, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so if God is a trinity and he's one but he's three, what does that then tell us about the image of God in us? Well, what it clearly says is that you were designed as an individual, yes, as one, but we're also designed to function together in community. Exactly. <laughs> right on cue. It was awesome. We have this innate need for community and with one another. Just like this child cannot survive on its own, you and I are designed to have a family around us. This is how we were designed. We've been talking about this for a couple weeks. So why do we feel lonely? Well, I feel lonely because somehow we're not experiencing the fullness of the community we were designed to experience. So what happened? If we're gonna continue this diagnosis of the problem, what happened? Well, of course what happened is the second crisis, which was sin. In the garden, Adam and Eve fell, but we need to think about what do we mean when we say the word sin? Because this will help us to better understand the issue. Okay, when we, typically we think about sin, we think of breaking the law. This past summer, we just went through Exodus, and we talked about this whole idea where God gives uh, Moses the Ten Commandments, do not covet, do not lie, do not steal, do not uh, commit adultery. And so we often think about sin is breaking the law. Now, that's only part of the issue. It isn't wrong but it doesn't get at the deeper root of the problem. It's just a symptom. Here, think about it this way. If your son or daughter followed all of your house rules, they came home at the right time, they didn't talk back to you, they didn't fight with one another, just like my children back at home, no, <laughs> no. Does that mean that they love you? Does that mean that they absolutely just adore you? No, it means they're probably afraid to get in trouble, right? So just because you follow the law does not mean you have a perfect relationship with God. In fact, you may just do this because you're afraid of being punished, but the whole time you might be resenting God in your heart saying, I don't like your laws at all. So the deeper issue behind sin 
is not just law-breaking, it is connected to this idea of autonomy. Do you know what the word autonomy means? It's this Latin word. It breaks down into two pieces. Auto, meaning self, and nomos, meaning law. So in other words, I want to be a law unto myself. I want to do what I want to do, and I'm not really interested in you telling me this, whether you're God or somebody else. We, through sin, want to be our own authority. We want to establish our independence, not just from God, but from one another. And so here's how scripture describes our autonomy in this fun little picture, which is actually very devastating. Isaiah 53, 6, it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. We've all expressed our independence to say, I do not want to be a part of the flock. I don't know much about sheep, but it's clear they are not the smartest creatures that God has ever designed which is why we're often called sheep in scripture, right? Have you heard of Chris the sheep by chance? This is an incredible story. Okay, so in Australia, uh, in, was it 20, 2015? Sheep, modern sheep, okay, are now designed in such a way that they've been bred for their wool. So they can't live on their own. They're designed to live in community. And so this sheep, Chris, wanders off and is living alone for six years, okay? As cute as that thing is, okay, that is not normal. That wool, when they, sh they sheared it off, 88 pounds, right? It was the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, and Underneath all the wool, they discovered that the sheep was actually malnourished. Why? Because the wool, I'm talking about pulling the wool over your eyes, right? The wool actually covered over his eyes and he actually didn't see food well, right? Okay, now the good news for all of you who are concerned about Chris is that he was shorn and then he was reintroduced back into the community where he was cared for and lived out a nice life, okay? So, I tell you this story because this is an example of the problem of our own autonomy. We say, I don't like the confines of the pen. I want to go do my own thing. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. The problem is then we look like Chris after a while, <laughs> all right? We need the care of God and we even need the community of the people around us. And so one of the things that this autonomy, okay, beneath the sin does, is it breaks not just our relationship vertically with God, it breaks our relationship with one another horizontally. In 1965, Paul Simon wrote this amazing song, I Am a Rock. Here's one of the verses. It says, I've built walls, a fortress deep and mighty, that none may penetrate. I have no need of friendship. Friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving I disdain. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I thought about it and I thought I will save you from the whole of the pain of my singing that. But because others have hurt us, we resonate with this song, don't we? We say, like Paul Simon, who's writing this ironically, right? He's trying to convince himself that I can be an island. I can be a rock. And he knows I can't really do this. All the while, it's ironic because what are we really longing for? We're longing for those relationships. We're longing for the connection to other people. No one can serve or survive well as a rock or an island. Okay, so let's put this all together. What's the diagnosis? Why are we lonely? We're lonely because we're made in the image of a triune God. You were designed for community. The problem is, because of sin, we have this tendency to be autonomous, to run away from the sheep pen and do our own thing, 
and we find ourselves shaggy and lost and need to go back into community. Here's the good news. God loves us so much that he not only brought healing vertically, he also brought the potential for healing horizontally. And this, this is the next step, okay? So I said we're going to talk about diagnosis. We're going to talk about what God did. Let's talk about what God did to help with this loneliness situation. When we talk about salvation, we most often refer to Jesus healing our relationship with the Father. We talk about a vertical healing, which is exactly right. Jesus came, he died for us so that we can have a healed relationship with the Father. If that's something you're interested in and you don't know about, I'd love to talk about it with you after the service. But that's just the beginning of the healing that Jesus brought. The healing begins vertically and then it moves horizontally. So let me explain this different. When somebody receives the Holy Spirit, okay, so you say, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. We receive the Holy Spirit. What that doesn't mean is that you get a little cup of the Spirit, and I get a cup of the Spirit, and you get a little cup. No, we all receive the one Holy Spirit, okay? And so then each one of us becomes a member of that body. We talked a little bit about this last week. So just as you have one spirit and that spirit animates your body, we, we have one Holy Spirit and that spirit brings us together into one body. You follow me? Okay. So we said this verse last week. Let's look at it again. Romans 12, 5, in Christ, though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Okay, we said last week that this word member is a beautiful word, but it's been hijacked by the world. Our culture took it and twisted it to mean if I pay my dues, I can belong to the club and I get special privileges. That's not what scripture says when it says you are a member of the church a member of the body of Christ. Remember, a arm is a member of your body, okay? That's the context that Scripture is talking about, membership. Your eye is a member of your body. You and I are members of the body of Christ. There's one spirit that animates us together to be like Jesus. Now, follow me on this, okay? What did God do to help us to alleviate this issue of loneliness, he not only helped to heal, not just help, he did, he healed the relationship with the Father, he also helped to heal our uh, brokenness with one another. And so to be a follower of Jesus Christ is not just to continue to live into repentance and repair our vertical relationship, it's also to live out our salvation horizontally and repent of my independence from the others that are around me. Does that make sense? So, it is much harder of a thing to do. Community is tough. I don't like it when I'm not always in charge. Community is inconvenient. Community is where I can get hurt sometimes. But when we begin through the Holy Spirit to feel the glue that begins to bring us together and says, by the Holy Spirit, we can begin to be community in ways that overcome the ways that the world hurts one another, all of a sudden we can truly be the people God designed us to be. You can look at the people next to you and say, they are my family, and as my family, they need me and I need them. So turn to the person next to you and say, you need me, okay? Yeah. All right. Some of you said that a little too emphatically, okay? As we come together, we often think of worship. Worship is a vertical thing. I close my eyes 
I was even sensitive to this as we sang, I exalt thee. Well, don't forget, we're all singing it together. Do you ever realize the reason we actually sing in church? Because it's one of the only things that we can do collectively as one body in prayer together. God's created song for that very reason. And as we come together as one body, it's an act of worship, not just vertically, horizontally as well. Romans 12.1 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Did you catch my little emphasis there? Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. This is the Trinity at action. Do you hear this? It's you are individuals, your bodies, now offer them as one, together as one. That means we have to love one another in such a way that we become this one living sacrifice collectively as an act of worship. So worship is not just about the songs we sing. It's not just about my individual relationship with Jesus. It's about our, our. In a few minutes, the choir is going to get up and they're going to sing about our Father to be able to recognize our collective identity. There's only one problem with the living sacrifice. It likes to jump off the altar. It's not easy to stay on the altar, but one of the ways that we worship is through loving the person next to us who sometimes may hurt us. And isn't that what happened to Jesus? This is what it means to be his disciples, to be people who make ourselves vulnerable enough to share our lives, to say, I will love you in such a way that I know you can probably hurt me. This is not to take down good boundaries. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But it is to say, I am willing to take a risk and love you. Jesus said, as we've said the last couple weeks, come follow me and I will make you all. I will make you into the humanity I always wanted you to be. I will bring restoration to you. And so Jesus could have said, by the way, come follow me and I will be your individual tutor. I'll bring you aside. John, now it's your turn. Let's have an hour together. Andrew, now it's yours. That's not what he did. He took them together as a group and said, I'm going to make you all. He began to shape these disciples into the humanity that they were created to be so that they could be not just holy, but become an apostolic blessing as they were sent out. So to be a faithful disciple is, yes, gather with God individually, gather with God the group, but there's something that means we have to go even a little bit deeper. And that's, that's the final part of where we're coming to. Okay, diagnosis. Loneliness comes because we are made in the image of a triune God. God brought healing through Jesus Christ, not just to help vertically, but also horizontally. So what is our church doing to help us grow into this worship which is growing together. One of the challenges of being in a church as large as we are is you can show up for weeks, months, and not really have a deep connection with someone because the fellowship that God is talking about here is not possible to have through coffee on the patio. Now, don't get me wrong, that is a great thing. But what God is really saying is, I need you to go and have deeper relationships. Now, the early church had the same problem, okay? Peter preaches on the first day the church is born. The Holy Spirit comes, knits them into a body, just like we're talking, 3,000 people. 3,000 people cannot have personal relationships. Acts 2.44, this is what happened. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, even Jesus only had a group of 12. He had the multitudes, but he could only build personal relationships with 12 people. And he showed us the example of what it means to follow him. This is why we have groups at PCC, not because it's something Willow Creek or Saddleback did and it's really cool. No, it's because this is what Jesus did and he showed us how to do it in a smaller group. These Christians gathered for corporate worship, but they also met in each other's homes. They ate together, they looked at the scriptures, they prayed together, and they even did some ministry together. And so this is why if you want to experience the fullness of the healing of loneliness in the context of what it means to be the church, shaped as Jesus' disciples, I love how Pastor Gary used to put this, it really happens in circles, not in rows. Real life change happens in circles, not in rows. And so our role as the church leaders is to help you to participate in this context. It's up to you to choose to be a part of that, but one of the reasons we're having these groups, and I've already heard so many good stories back. I heard about somebody this past week who was saying, we were almost in tears just being together the first week, and we automatically felt like we were friends. Um, our women the other day, you, you, um, I'm really proud of you guys, meeting together on Friday night, and somebody said, I just met with my group once, and then I walked into the women's event, and somebody walks up and hugs me because we just were a part of this group. Um, it works. And so even though we've already met uh, one time as growth groups, if you're not in a group, I guarantee you that someone's not going to say, no, 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 we already started, you're done. No, we have groups that are still open. If you want to give this a try, that's why they're there. You, right on the porch out there, someone will help you, um, or you can go on the church app um, uh, or on the website. So let me conclude this um, just by sharing a little bit of how God used community in my own life. Um, when I was 16, I went to a Young Life camp. I've shared this before that I met Christ. The same leader took me home, and I still remember him looking me at McDonald's. And this is not really the, the context, I think, of Jesus saying, come follow me, but it was in McDonald's. And he says, would you like to meet with a couple other guys, and we're going to go deeper? Yeah, I'd like that. I had no idea how impactful that was going to be for me. We met every Saturday morning during high school, which I still can't believe we did this, seven in the morning. Um, those guys are still some of my deepest friends. We text one another all the time. We call each other. There, we're, we're, all three of us are deeply still followers of Jesus, and a couple of us are still in ministry. Um, and I can't tell you how much of a difference it made. We, we came together and we opened the Bible, but that wasn't it. We prayed together, and we did life together. They became my best friends. And I, I hope that could be something also for you. If you're old enough, you may remember this theme song from the 80s sitcom Cheers. This one, fine. I will sing if you join me. Okay, But you, you need to drown me out, okay? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see. Our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. Woo! 
Isn't that, isn't that what we long for? You long, I long for a place where people know us. Not just know our name, but we share our troubles together because we're all going through them. A place where we can be community. Let me let you know a little secret. You will not find that at a bar. Okay? As much as it happened at Cheers, it was a sitcom. Okay? <laughs> but you can find it here at the church. Now, it may take a little bit of effort to get there. It doesn't happen immediately. But God will bring it. It's not good to be alone. The church is designed to help us live into the salvation that Jesus has brought, not just for healing with God vertically, but also horizontally. And if you're lonely today, we want to help. I want to help. I want to help you to grow together with others and grow together as a community, being shaped by Jesus into this loving community. So let's pray. You are our Father, and we then are your adopted children. Lord, in some ways it's a lot easier to connect with you than it is to connect with others. But really, we were designed for this, and we, we even know it. We know it. So would you help us to live as community, Lord? Would you help us to live into this biblical idea? And would you, would you help the person right now who's feeling lonely? Would you help them to have the courage to reach out? And then, Lord, forgive us in the church for not being more proactive to invite others to be a part of our group. Forgive us for being groups that just kind of have this holy huddle sometimes without letting those who are lonely in. It's not what you designed us to be. So help us, help us, Father, to be a community that we just say loneliness should never exist here. And help us to help the world to see this is a place where you can have your loneliness healed. We wanna be at a place where everybody knows us, a place where we all share, because we all have the same troubles and Jesus, thank you for healing those troubles. Help us to live into that healing. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.